nothing is by coincidence. I was planning to speak about the purpose of building a Bet HaMikdash. <clears throat> Why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu command us to build a temple? And it's not a coincidence that we're speaking about it tonight, because in Kaf Hei Be Kislev, 25th day of Kislev, which is very soon, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, which was the first temple of sorts that the Jewish people erected, was completed on the 25th of Kislev. Even though it was put up, it was erected on the first day of Nisan, the work was pretty much completed in Kislev. And that is why, in some ways, Hanukkah is also tied to that day. Minashamayim, they made it happen so that the inauguration, the re-inauguration of the Bet HaMikdash would occur on the, on the day that the Mishkan was completed. So what I'm going to do is explain tonight what's the idea behind building a Bet HaMikdash. Why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Almighty, need a home? And in reality, that is the question Moshe Rabbeinu asked himself when he heard the instructions, the commandment, make me a home. The entire universe is your home. And is it really possible to make you a home down here in this world below? So that's our question tonight. It's really not fair uh, to speak about such a great topic uh, an hour's time that would not really do justice to explaining what the Beta Migdash is. But as Hillel once told a potential convert, you want to learn the entire Torah al regal ahat while you're standing on one foot? You should love your friend as you love yourself. That is the essence of the Torah. The rest, zil gmor. The rest, go ahead and learn on your own pace whenever you have a chance. So what we'll cover now is obviously not the entire topic. There's so much material, there's so much information, there's so much even Kabbalah that is behind this structure that we call Bet HaMikdash that we can't possibly encompass all of it. But we'll cover the basics of what the Bet HaMikdash represents and why is it so important for the Jewish people that Hashem actually makes that request, gives us that mitzvah. The basic idea behind a Bet Mikdash down here below, a home for Hashem down here in the lower worlds, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should have a connection with us in a very, very direct way. This idea of having a direct connection with human beings flies in the face, as we say in English, of all the, pretty much all the cultures and religions that I'm aware of, that many of them have believed or still believe that this great God who created the world has nothing to do and does not relate to us people down here below. He's there and we are here and there's no connection, there's no real connection. So the, the basic idea of having a home down here, it basically destroys or goes against all these other beliefs that that's not so. And we are here making a point by building this Bet HaMikdash that yes, it is so. HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not only create the world, he's actually involved in the most minute details with everything that happens in this world, but especially with Am Yisrael, with the Jewish nation, where he is involved in what we call Ashgaha Pratit, in English, divine providence. He created the world, yes, but that he's actually involved, he's aware of everything, he directs everything. That's a big chidush. Not everybody believes in this. The Greeks were totally opposed to this kind of an idea. So that is one of the reasons why they did not get along with the Jews. Obviously the Jews were saying something so strange, so different than what they were saying, that man is the center of everything here. He should be worshipped, if anything. And here we're saying, no, Hashem is everywhere. Hashem is down here below as well. And not only is He here below, He actually wants to be. He wants to make a connection with us at all times. 
And that is the meaning of what the Torah says. Vasuli Mikdash, built for me a Mikdash. But when it comes to residing in the Mikdash, it says Veshachanti Betocham, the al Sheikh, a great commentary who lived in the 1500s, great Kabbalist, student of Dari, interprets these words, Veshachanti Betocham. It should have said Veshachanti Betocho, and I will reside in it. I will reside in you, meaning that the, the Ikar HaMikdash, the main temple, is not a structure of stones. Is I want to reside in you, within you. I want that connection to be with you, really you, not a building, not any structure. So here we're putting up a structure, we'll be, we're building a home for Hashem, but ultimately the real connection is what Hashem wants. It's with us, not with the building. Therefore, make for me a mikdash v'shachanti betocham. I want to be in the heart of every single Jew. So what that means is that every Jew needs on his own to make of himself a mikdash. Every Jew needs to make of his home a mikdash too. And the various kelim, as we will see soon, the various items that we had in the temple, also exists in one home too, are supposed to exist. exist. And the service that we had in the Beit HaMikdash similarly is a service that we have to have in our own home. So let's begin to explain a little bit what the word Mikdash means. The Torah calls this Mikdash a Mishkan, but it's also called a Mikdash. What do the words mean? Mishkan comes from the word Shochen, to reside. Hashem therefore calls this place a Mishkan, because he can reside in it. We call it Mikdash because it is through our actions, Shanachnu Mekachimoto, that we elevate it, that we make it holy, we sanctify it. Bet Mikdash, therefore, means what? The house, the structure of that which we have sanctified. That place, that location, that home, or ourselves, of course. What are we exactly are we elevating? What is the word Kedusha? Kedusha means to make a connection with he that is holy. Kadosh Baruch Kadosh, and he wants us to be like him. He wants us to connect with him. And by doing certain ma'asim, certain misvot, we're able to make this connection and elevate ourselves, which means what? What does it mean to elevate? It means to get closer to him. That's the simple meaning of Kedusha. When a person, when a human being is Kadosh, he's holy, it means he has elevated himself to a point of becoming closer to God. And that's a very, very important point for the following reason. People can easily make the mistake that Kedusha means spirituality. There's a lot of people meditating right now, as we speak, in the Himalayas. Yoga, etc., all kinds of things, trying to elevate themselves too. Do they elevate themselves? They become more spiritual. I don't uh, disagree with that. Yes, they can become more spiritual. At the expense of, of what? At the expense, of course, of making the physical body unimportant, right? By depriving that physical body of food, of drink, of sleep, of speech, you actually become more spiritual. Fine. That's not the idea of what the Torah wants us to do. A big difference between Judaism and other religions is, Judaism tells us the body is special too. It depends how you use it. You can elevate that body too. You can sanctify the body too. You can make the body a holy body, a vessel, a mikdash for Hashem. Don't deprive it. Don't kill it. Get married. Yes, get married. Have a wife. Love a woman. Your wife. Right? Marry. Have kids. Make this connection in the physical world. But do it in a holy way. Just do it in a holy way. And you have taken the body, the physical body, this physical world, and you have elevated it. And that's, of course, something that's not very understood by other religions. But Judaism very much puts an emphasis on this idea called Kedushah. 
that the human being is capable of because of his neshama, but it has to be done in a certain way. And the Torah prescribes to us what that way is. On our own, we wouldn't know what to do. Look what all these other people are doing on their own. They're not really doing the right thing. They're not necessarily making that strong connection that we're talking about. They're becoming spiritual perhaps, but what do we want to do? It's not just to become spiritual, we want to make a connection. And to make a connection with Hashem, we need to elevate ourselves. We need to sanctify our deeds. And we need to do it according to His instructions because He tells us how to do it. On our own, we don't know how to do it. So this Kedusha is a connection with Him who is holy. It's not just being spiritual. Why does this need to come about through a Mikdash or a Mishkan? When HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world, if you look at Prashat Bereshit, and we say it every Friday night when you say Kiddi Kiddush, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu completed his work in creating the world, it says that he's rested, that he created to do. To do? That he created, that was done. What do you mean to do? To do, la'asot, implies that there's something left that's not complete. It says la'asot. It should have said, mikol melachto ha'shavara lokim, asher asa. That he did. No, la'asot. La'asot implies there's something left undone. And the Midrash says, yes. Up until Shalomo HaMelech built completed the Bet HaMikdash, the world was incomplete. Only when he inaugurated the Bet HaMikdash, the first one, then it says, Vatechal HaMelacha. Then it says that the work was completed. Not just the work of the temple, the work, to some extent, of the entire creation. Without a Bet HaMikdash, the world is incomplete. And that is why I saw, I think it's also a Midrash, the yeah, same Midrash, why was Shalomo Melech called Shalomo? There's various explanations, but one explanation is that it is through him that Hashem Hishlim completed his work. Shalomo is the same word as Shalem, to complete. And the same is true about every one of us. Every human being has this responsibility, this task of completing himself. We grow physically almost automatically. You just give a little bit of cereal to a child, and he'll grow. He may become even seven foot two. <laughs> Not just five eight, right? Just a little bit of cereal, pour it down his mouth, and he'll grow physically. But obviously, there needs to be a spiritual growth too. And that is up to us to do, to work on ourselves. After all, spirituality or spiritual growth does not stop at age 18, as physical growth do. It can go on forever. Rabbis tell us also that at the time the Shlomo Melech completed his temple down here below, the temple was completed upstairs too. In the same way that there is a temple down here in this world, there's also a temple in the other worlds. And that temple is very similar in pretty much everything that this temple has down here. As we will soon see and, and explain a little bit the purpose of all the kelim that we had, whether it was a shulchan, the table, a menorah, and Aron, all of these things exist in the physical world and they have a counterpart in the spiritual world. Why do there need to be a counterpart? Why do there need to be two temples? Because there's a connection between what happens down here to what happens up, up above. And what happens up above can reflect what is going down down here below. So ultimately, in the same way that a human being consists of something spiritual in him and something physical, right? Two parts, neshama and guf. In the same way, there's a connection between the physical world and the spiritual world. There's a real connection that we don't see, but it exists. Now, before the Bet HaMikdash was completed, the world stood, the Midrash says, on two legs. Now, can anything stand on two legs? It's shaky. 
So the world was on a shaky ground. In other words, it could not really, really last this way. Until the Mishkan, first the Mishkan, and then the Beit HaMikdash, was erected. Once that happened, now the world stands on three feet, on three legs. In other words, now it's firm. Now everything is settled. Now everything is in peace. What are these three legs? Rabbis tell us that the world stands on three things. Ala Torah, Valavoda, Velgmilut Chasadim. It stands on the leg of Torah, on the leg of Avoda, which is the service of Hashem, and on the leg of acts of kindness. What's the importance of all these three legs? Torah, the importance of the leg of the Torah is to perfect ourselves. Torah gives us guidance. It tells us how to improve, how to perfect, how to do our jobs. So we, for ourselves, we need Torah for our personal growth. Gemilut chasadim, very simple. What do we need kindness for? Between us and our fellow man. It's not just for ourselves, like the Torah is. Gemilut chasadim, kindness is necessary. Olam chesed yibaneh, in order to make a strong connection between people. That's how people are connected. They help each other. They depend on each other. And then we have Avodah. Avodah is for our connection with Hashem. So we have something for ourselves. We have something between us and our friends. All of humanity in reality. Then we have something between us and Hashem. These are the three legs. Now when we had a Beta Mikdash, that Avodah was a pretty... Uh, major amount of of work involved, a whole uh, enterprise, if we can call it, of sacrifices and all kinds of services that would take part in the Beit Hamidash. Today that we don't have the Beit Hamidash, we still have Avodah. And today, the, for the most part, the Avodah consists of tefillah, prayer, which means that through this medium called prayer, one can make a connection with Hashem too. And it's not only a connection. In the same way that through the services in the Beit HaMikdash, we were able to accomplish a lot of things, as I will soon tell you. In the same way, tefillah, we should not be underestimated. Tefillah is a medium by which we can accomplish a great deal. We can cancel decrees. We can change mazal. Tefillah is powerful. People underestimate the koach, the power of tefillah. Today we have no korban, no sacrifices, no beta midash. We don't have all that service, that beautiful and great service that we had that was powerful indeed. But we have something, I don't want to call it close, but something that's similar, that can have a similar effect on us in building at least that connection with Hashem. Just a little bit of history. We spoke about Mishkan and Mikdash. The Mishkan, as it started out, lasted for 39 years in the desert. Am Yisrael was in the desert for 40 years. And after the first year, they started building the Mishkan. And they had it until they entered Eretz Yisrael. So how many years? 39. So we have the Mishkan in Eretz Yisrael as a temporary Mikdash, because it's moving, for 39 years. Am Yisrael enters Eretz Yisrael, fights for seven years, divides the land for an additional seven years, a total of 14 years, during which this time the Mishkan is in a place called Gilgal. Okay, Mishkan in Gilgal. Then the Mishkan was in Shiloh for 369 years. That was already a partial structure made out of stone. Mishkan Avanim, at least the walls. And the last two locations where the Mishkan stood, some sort of Mishkan, was in Nov and in Giv'on, a total of 57 years. Altogether, we should have approximately 440 years of Mishkan, of a temporary abode, if we can call it that, for Hashem. When is the Beta Migdash, the first one, finally built? In the year 2928. It took seven years. Shlomo Melech was the main engineer and contractor. 
even though David Melech was the architect in a, in a sense, Hashem gave those instructions for David Melech, for Shlomo Melech to eventually build. And he did so. Unfortunately, that temple, as well as the second temple that was built later on when Amisel came back from Galut Bavel, from Babylonia, were both destroyed. The first, time, first one lasting 410 years, the second one lasting 420 years, the first one being destroyed in the year 3338 from creation, the second one being built in the year 3408, approximately, I mean it took a little while for it to be built, and lasting till the year 3828. And now, of course, all of us are waiting for the building of the third temple. One thing about the third temple is that it will never be destroyed. It will be forever, eternal, lasting, because it will be built not by the hands of man, but by, the, by Hashem Himself. Even though our tradition says that Mashiach is the one that builds it, the Zohar says that there is a Mikdash that comes down from above too, upon the Mikdash that Mashiach prepares. And this Mikdash will begin to take shape before Kibbutz Galuyot is completed. Kibbutz Galuyot is the gathering of the diaspora. Jews are already there, over 6 million right now as we're speaking in Israel. For the first time in the history of the diaspora of Edom, right? We're almost 2,000 years out of Israel. And for the first time in the history, there are more Jews in Israel than anywhere else in the world, any other country in the world. So that's good news. But the Kibbutz Galuyot is not complete yet. There's, many of us are still here. <laughs> Ooh, B'zat Hashem will be there very, very soon. But in the meantime, there are still Jews all over the world. Kib the Binyan Bet HaMikdash, which is one of the stages of the Messianic era, occurs before Kibbutz Galuyot is complete. So not everybody will be there by the time the Bet HaMikdash is built up. Right? We have various stages Right, we have Kibbutz Galuyot, we have the building of Bet HaMikdash, we have Tchiyat HaMetim, when the dead will rise. Various stages that will take a number of years. A number of years till everybody gets there, till the whole land is, is developed, it's built up. Right now, what are we hold, where are we holding? We're holding just about uh, 60, almost 61 years since the Jews got Israel back into their hands from the British. Right? But not everything is exactly the way it should be, unfortunately. Soon it will be. That's why we're waiting for Mashiach. But anyway, this Bet HaMikdash will be very, very different because it will be built through the hands of Hashem. In other words, Hashem will be involved in that building as opposed to the first ones that were built by man. And because they were built by man, they could easily be destroyed, especially if man does not behave himself. He himself does not have a Mishkan. He himself does not make of himself a Mikdash. So therefore the structure accomplishes nothing. And Hashem has to vacate the premises, unfortunately. The location of this Beta Mikdash is in a special place in Hara Moriya in Yerushalayim. Why? So we've been speaking about the ultimate idea that the Beta Mikdash represents a connection between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, a holy connection, therefore a holy structure, which needs to be in a very special place too. Isn't it going to be the same place as the first two pieces? Of course, yeah. Everything will be in the same place. But what's so significant about the location? Why not in Hollywood? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's where all the stars are. Yeah. <laughs> But if you look at everything in Judaism, you will see that there is a favorite in everything. There is a favorite land. Eretz Israel is holier than all other lands. Hashem chose Eretz Israel. There is the Jewish people that Hashem chose, not necessarily because we're better, like some people make a mistake, oh, you think yourself you're better. No, not because we're better. Shem chose us because we had certain qualities that he was looking for. You know, if you ask somebody to do something for you, you hope he's reliable, right? And he basically chose us because we were the most reliable in a sense, even though we did not always do the job right, we failed many times. 
But Baruch Hashem, until today, there are still Jews who are practicing Judaism. So he, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was not wrong in his choice. Not everybody succeeded, but the nation as a whole succeeded in carrying us. So he chose the Jews. He chose Eretz Israel. He chose Kohanim from amongst the Jews to do a certain important job. And from those who are non-Kohanim, he also chose and made holy the Bechor, the firstborn. Right? And in the same way, he chose Yerushalayim too, and he chose Haramoriya, that particular location, for reasons that only Hashem knows, that that is a special location. Yeah, we spoke about that. Yeah. And that particular location is called Machon Leshiftecha. That is the, the residing place of Hashem, that is his address, where if we want to speak to him, we go there. And if we're not there, we face there. That's the location. Now that I've given you more or less a description and an introduction of this whole concept of the Beta Mikdash, now let's analyze what this Mikdash does for us and does for the world. In other words, why is it really that important? There are basically three ideas or three things that the Bet HaMikdash represents or accomplishes. One is it protects us from the Sitra Hara, from the Kohot Tuma. What does that mean? It's a fact that in this world, HaKadosh Baruch Hu also created negative forces. Some people like to call it negative energies. We call it Tuma, Sitra Hara, impurities. The problem with them is even though Hashem's intention was to allow for free will, for a competition of sorts, it turns out that many times these competing forces remove us from our connection that we're supposed to have with Hashem. They compete. One of those tremendous competitors was Abu Dazara in the past, during the first temple era and before, and a little bit after. This Avodah Zarah business was a tremendous danger. Many good people, Jews, who were tefillin and tzitzit, worshipped idols. And we cannot understand that because today there's no Yetzara for idolatry. And all the paganism you have is just traditional. They don't really believe in this stuff that much. They don't even, know, they don't even understand what it is. But once upon a time it really had a koach. Koach Meshicha, it drew, it was like a magnet. Because it really had a koach. It does have power. Witchcraft has power. That draws from that, from the Tumah. So the Beta Mikdash, being a location where all the Kedusha is concentrated in, would have the power, through the service done there, of course, to block away that Tumah, to not allow it to interfere with our service to Hashem. We needed that particular location, we needed a particular spot where we can do what we need to do without being interfered, without, be, without having anything outside bother us. And there's unfortunately too many negative forces out there that that is their job, <clears throat> to disturb, to interfere, to misguide us, Everything with the intention of driving us away from the service of Hashem. And it has different forms and shapes, this force, in the, depending on the generation where one lives. Today, there's a lot of other impurities too that are very tempting and that are misleading and that take Jews away from that connection that they're supposed to have. So having a Bet HaMikdash or today a Bet Midrash, a Bet Knesset, which is in a mini temple, mini holy temple, can have a little bit of, of protection to the Jew. If he's tied to it, if he's connected, if he attends services, if he learns there, he's running away from all that darkness outside. He's immersing himself in holiness. And by doing so, he is allowing himself to be somewhat protected from all that is going on out there. So that is one idea of the importance of the necessity of why we need to have this kind of a place. Number two, by, by the way, the Midrash does say that before the Mishkan was built, the Mazikim, all the harmful elements in the world like demons, 
had much more power and caused a lot, much, a lot more harm to people. Once the Mishkan was erected, it like drove them away. They had to hide. They, they had to go to the deserts. They had to go elsewhere. That holiness drove them away. And that, uh, that is what a mezuzah really does also, amongst other things, when we put it on the entrance of our home and in all the rooms that require it. The, the name of Hashem that stands out facing us, Shin Dalet Yud, drives away all the mazikim and demons do not allow them to enter that home. So besides fulfilling a mitzvah, one it actually has a better protection to his home than any insurance could uh, provide for him. A real protection. You should still get a home insurance, you know, just in case, you know, something happens to your mezuzah, but but that's what it is. A mishkan, a mikdash, is able to protect one inside by driving away all these elements outside that are uh, from the Tumah, from the Sitra Achara. So, number two, through building this Beta Mikdash, we spoke about having a connection. This connection brings about a continuous reminder to us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mashgiach Aleinu Mashgacha Pratit, that He's directly involved in our lives through divine providence, and we are not subjected to the Mazalot, to the stars like the Goyim are. Another area of contention or difference between Jews and non-Jews. The Torah actually predicts this and actually tells us they are going to be always thinking about the stars and let them think so because they don't have that divine protection or divine providence that I have with you. That relationship that I have with you, they don't have. So let them look at the stars. Let them read their horoscopes every day in the LA Times if they choose to. Now, those horoscopes don't say anything, really. You, how could it be that millions of people born in the same month have the exact same mazal? They don't. But there's sometimes there's certain little things that apply to every mazal. We don't have to look at it. And we shouldn't pay attention to these things because we have ashgaha pratit, which is a, 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 so beautiful that Kadosh Baruch knows exactly what's going on in every single minute. I mean, he knows what's going on with everyone, but he does not get involved as involved as he gets involved with us. So through this Beta Mikdash, we would actually observe. It was not just to make us aware. We would actually observe so many miracles that took place on a daily basis in the first, especially in the first temple, that whoever did not live in Yerushalayim and came three times a year was amazed. And par partially that was the reason for the mitzvah of Aliyah la Regal. Go to Jerusalem, to the Beta Mikdash, three times a year. You live in Tveria? And all day long, all you do is cultivate your fields and, work, and milk your cows and collect the eggs of your chickens, right? I mean, what, what, I mean there, was no in, there was no industry back then. It was an agricultural society. People worked hard. They woke up early in the morning. And at night, they went to sleep early. You know why? Because there was no TV, right? There were no movies. There were no lights. People went to sleep early. That's it. That was the whole day. Work, work, work. And of course, they prayed. And they learned a little bit, depending on the individual, three times a year to come and see this Beta Mikdash. You know what it meant? It was an experience of a lifetime. And once every seven years for the women to come too with the little children, psh, and to hear the Kohen Gadol, to hear the king. I mean, it was an incredible experience. Today, people would not go. They would say, I can see it on the internet. <laughs> But it's not the same. You know what it is to go today, even today, to Yerushalayim, even if you've been there before. Every time I go, it's an incredible experience, even though there's no Bet HaMikdash. Just to be at that location where the Bet HaMikdash once stood, I recharge my batteries. We even have pictures of the inside where the errors made on the map. We have pictures. If you go to my website, yeah. I have a website link to the um, Jerusalem Morovi. Right. Right. Yeah, obviously we don't know exactly what everything looked like, but we do have the dimensions, we do have diagrams, and we do have some pictures based on, based on what uh, different authors have put together of what it looks like. So, so far we've covered two ideas of what the Beta Midash would accomplish. A tremendous protection from all the Tumah and Sitra Achara, 
a, a way of connecting with Hashem that would remind us, make us aware that we have Ashgaha Pratit. And number three is Kaparat Avonot. Kaparat Avonot means through the Bet HaMikdash and the service that exists in the Bet HaMikdash, we were able to attain an atonement. Now this one is another big punch in the face of all those who say, he died for everybody's sins. Right? I don't have to elaborate. Right? What do you mean? <laughs> We're not going to speak about that subject now, but this is exact opposite. No, it is each and everyone's responsibility. Each and every one is accountable for his actions, and let him get his own atonement by way of a korban, a sacrifice, by coming to the Bet HaMikdash, by confessing. After all, there were sins that Korbanot, you know, could not help for. Things that were done intentionally, the Korban cannot always help you with that. Korban Chatat, which will be I think next week's topic is what's the idea of behind all the sacrifices. The very same, it's a very fascinating topic. What did they accomplish? Why different kinds? A bird, an animal. What was being done? But for the most part, it was something done unintentional. If you did something intentional, the sacrifice would not even help you. So their idea of this, this guy coming and being a scapegoat is totally ridiculous. I mean, it's very foreign to what we believe in. We believe in that everybody is responsible for their own actions. But not only that, Hashem says, I allow you and I enable you to be able to cleanse yourself, to be able to get atonement. And why would you want an atonement? Because all this shefa, all this blessing and abundance that you're getting through this temple, I want you to continue to have it. Because once you sin, you've broken that connection. And you've broken that connection, that means you're, you've distanced yourself. You've distanced yourself, you not, may not be getting all that blessing that you've been getting, all that protection that you've, been, you've, you've had. I want you to come back. Teshuvah, to come back. And therefore, I need to show you how to do it. Bet HaMidash, the service in the Bet HaMidash, the Korbanot in the Bet HaMidash, allowed one to reconnect to Kadosh Baruch Hu. We can do that today too, through Teshuvah. But it's not the same. It's not 100% the same. When we had a Bet HaMidash, it was a very powerful uh, way of reconnecting. And just the service of the Kohen Gadol and Yom HaKippurim accomplished so much things that we could not do on our own, that he had to do for us, for the Jewish nation. As far as the building of the Bet HaMikdash, it was also very special. If you read the description of how the first one was built, you will find that it is very similar to how a Mizbeach, an altar, should be built, that the Torah talks about. Lo tanifa lav barzel. Do not raise on it metal. The first Bet HaMikdash, all of it, was built without the use of metal. No hammers, no forklifts, <laughs> nothing. Because metal does what? Cuts short a person's life. Knives, guns, swords, right? And the Bet HaMikdash is intended to lengthen a person's life to bring life, to bring peace, the opposite of war, the opposite of death. So this whole Bet HaMikdash, the structure of it was also built in a very specific way and also contained various kelim, various things that through their service we were able to achieve something. So a quick, a quick list of some of those more famous uh, kelim. We had the Shulchan and the Lechem Apanim the 12 breads on a special table. It, it was a service that was meant for us to connect to Hashem, who is the mashpia, umechalkel. He's the one that provides our livelihoods. He's the one that gives us food on the table, and it's not our PhD. There are many people who have a PhD today who are out of a job, right? Unemployment affects everybody. Parnasai is from heaven, Parnasai is Hashemayim. And through that Shulchan and Lechem Apanim, we were able to bring about this abundance, we were able to connect to Kadosh Baruch Hu in the sense of reminding ourselves that Parnasai is from Him. How do we do that today? 
Anybody know? By making blessings before we eat and after we ate. Blessings that we did not have in the very past. I'm not saying that Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov did not make blessings, because from what we know, they did make blessings. That's what they taught people to do, to recognize that this is from him. But the actual composition of words that we have today is from Ansheh Knesset Agdola, during the, a part of the end of the first temple era and beginning of the second temple era. All, uh, many, many halachot were introduced concerning prayer. And that is what we have today, instead of the korbanot and the sacrifices. That is our way to connect to Hashem. That is our way to remind ourselves to the blessings that the Parnassah is from Him. Then we have the Mizbeach HaNechoshet, or Mizbeach HaDama, later on, the copper altar, the outside exterior altar, the big altar for the sacrifices. That is to cleanse ourselves, to purify ourselves from our sins, in order to bring about that shefa, that abundance, that may have been taken away through, our, through sin. Then you have the Mizbech HaZahav and the Ktoret, the golden, smaller Mizbech that was inside the main chamber, and the Ktoret, the incense that was burned on top of it. That was to remove all impurities, and as the Zohar, I believe, says also, to cancel out any Kishufim, any witchcraft, that somebody, a spell that may, somebody may have, may have cast on a Jew. That ketoret on the Mizbeach HaZahab had a tremendous power to cancel out witchcraft. Aharon used, this, used the ketoret in the Torah to cancel magifot, terrible plagues. And it's still, I mean, known as a tremendous powerful sigula, just that we don't have it today. And we don't know how to, do, how to put it together. And even if we knew we're not allowed to, it had that segula, it had that metaphysical power of being able to drive away all sorts of impurities, including witchcraft. Then we have the menorah, which we have very soon, Baruch Hashem, the menorah of Hanukkah. It's not exactly the same. You know why? This, the menorah of Hanukkah, has eight lights, and that one had seven. And even though some of the ideas are similar, the Hanukkah is a celebration for something else, but the menorah, the constant lighting of the menorah, was an important service in the Beit HaMidash. For what? Where does the light come from? It comes from oil. Where does the oil come from? The oil is the essence of the olive. And so is the neshama, the essence of the human being. And we are told that in the same way that we cleanse the light of the menorah on a regular basis by lighting it, by cleaning it, we need to cleanse ourselves. We need to take care of our neshama which is the essence, that's the, not the body. You, you eat, you drink, you sleep, because you have no choice. That's the fuel of the physical body, but we must take care of our neshama. And how do we cleanse and take care of our neshama? Through light, the light of the Torah. So the menorah represented the Torah. The light of the menorah is the light of the Torah, which guides us. And it's through and by way of the Torah that one is able to cleanse and purify himself. There's no other way to do it. You can't do it by saying, you will be saved by this guy. No, you got to do it yourself. Nobody saves you but yourself. And the one gives you the guidance of how to do it, the kalim, the tools, is Torah. There are many couples that I've met that have trouble in Shalom Bayit. There's no harmony and peace at home. They're both fine people, the husband and the woman. They're both great. But neither of the two, or at least one of them, does not have sometimes the kalim, the tools of how to make it work. They're upset at each other, and they don't know what to do. What to do, you know, what's the right thing to do. And at some point, they also have given up. They don't want to do it. And that's a shame. If one is not connected to the Torah, he may not succeed in holding his home together, unless he's an angel, such a good neshama, like we say in Yiddish, or she is, that they're willing to just tolerate each other and share the same home then it's possible too. But without Torah, it's very difficult. That's why the rabbis warn us. Ignorance is the greatest enemy of the Jew. Lo amaretz chasid, velo bur chet. An ignoramus, an empty person of Torah, in Yerat Shemaim, I mean, he cannot accomplish anything. He's very, very far, very, very far from, from the fulfillment of mitzvot, 
because he won't know what to do. But besides fulfillment of mitzvot, he will be such an unrefined person without Torah. He cannot become a Hasid, a true Yireh Chet, a true God-fearing Jew. It's not possible without Torah. So, and ignorance is also dangerous because missionaries can make a Jew fall, trip, and be taken hostage by these other cults if he has no way of defending what he believes in. And this unfortunately has happened too many times. So that's why the, or, the light of the Torah in the, in the menorah was an important symbol in that it represents the essence of who we are and what we need to survive. Then we have the Aaron. Aaron is how we call the Aaron in English. The Ark that contained the tablets, that contained the Sefer Torah, which Moshe Rabbeinu wrote. It contained the broken tablets and the second tablets, plus one Sefer Torah. That's what, but that was in the Ark. And that represents the Torah in itself. But that represents the Torah which we would take with us wherever we would go. When they went to war, to battle, they took it with them to remind them that the Nisachon triumph in battle comes from Hashem, not from our own hands. The one who protects us from our enemies is Hashem. So it's not only the learning of the Torah, but it was the connection with Hashem through the Torah that will provide us the protection, not missiles, not missile shields, and definitely not Uncle Sam. Definitely not. Only a Kadosh Baruch Hu himself. Then we had the Kruvim and the Kaporet. The Kruvim and the Kaporet was a one solid piece of gold, which was on top of the Ark. The image of two little kids facing each other, which is supposed to represent the relationship between us and Akadosh Baruch Hu, the Chiba, the affection that we're supposed to have, us with him and him with us. Now, what is that? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to get to that. In the appearance, in the appearance of the two facing each other, you saw either, one opinion says, kids, husband and wife, or angels. There's three kinds of appearances in those two images facing each other. As kids, the meaning behind that is the importance, to remind us of the importance of transmitting to future generations that Torah. This is sitting on the ark, the solid piece of gold. The importance of transmitting this to the future generation, to our kids. And the purity of kids learning Torah, you know, Koshul Bet Rabban as well. The interpretation or the appearance of a husband facing his wife is also important because that is supposed to remind us how we are supposed to be connected with Hashem. As a husband and wife should be really connected, one with the other, not apart. And then the image of angels is supposed to bring about an aspiration in us. To elevate ourselves and be like the angels. And that can only happen by way of the Torah on which the, kap on which the kaporet was sitting on top of. So again, through this Torah we're able to build a Jewish home husband and, where a husband and wife can have their own mikdash. Through the Torah, we're able to elevate ourselves to the level of Malachim. And of course, the importance of giving all that over to the kids. There were various ways that through this Beta Mikdash, Am Yisrael was able to tell if Hashem is pleased with us or not. How could one tell? I gave a lecture many years ago of how one can tell in general terms by seeing if there is a rain or a lack of rain in Israel. If we're if we have to defend ourselves from our enemies constantly, and if the economy is not doing too well. These are three important areas that one can tell if they're not doing well, he's not happy with us. But during the time that we had a Bet HaMidash, you could actually see it. In the following way, through the Kruvim, the Kruvim were those two angelic or kids images that were facing each other. If they were not facing exactly each other, but they were a little bit apart, on the side, moved away, that was not a good sign. You could also sense it from the hands of the Kohanim, when they would bless us, if they would feel heavy, Hashem was not pleased with us. You can also see it from the incense on the Ketoret. If everything was great, that smoke of the incense rose like a straight pillar. 
if things were not right, it would sway. On the Mizbeach outside, if things were doing well, the flame of the fire of the Korbanot would appear or take on the, sometimes the image of a lion. If things were not right, it would sometimes appear like a dog. So from that, you could see a lot of things. This is especially true in the first temple. Also, there was a, another sign that the Badim, the poles from the Aron, from the Ark, how they stuck out through the paroche, through the curtain, you were able to tell that. It was as though there was a connection between Hashem and us, like a husband and wife. Through the Nera Maravi, the main central light of the menorah, called Nera Maravi, Shelokaba, that would never extinguish if our relation with Hashem was strong. And there's another indicator, if Chaz smoke would come out from between the Keruvim, between those two figures, it was also not a good sign. There were various ways that one can tell where we stood in our relationship with Hashem. The Midrash says something incredible. If the Goim only knew what this place does for them, what it means for the world, the best, this Bet HaMikdash, they would never have destroyed it. On the contrary, they would have protected They would have sent guards not to touch it. Because Bet HaMikdash was not only a great benefit and a need for Am Yisrael, it did so much for the entire world. <laughs> Had they only known. Yeah, obviously, but when things were falling apart on a spiritual level down here below, when people were destroying their own Mikdash, which is the main Mikdash, the internal one, obviously there was no need for this Mikdash. The connection is gone, it disappears. And that is the way Hashem lets us know that we're not okay. But it's in the worst case possible. It's the last resort. And that is why the Gemara says too, that every generation where the Bet HaMikdash is not rebuilt, it is as though it destroyed it because we still have the same sin or the same problems and weaknesses that existed back then. This Mikdash of ours is not built up yet. Nevertheless, the good news is, even though the Bet HaMikdash is not there, Lozaza Shechina Mikotela Maravi, the Shechina never departed the western wall of the Bet HaMikdash. So it's still there. The Mikotela Maravi, the According to our tradition, the Shekhinah is still there. Just like to finish with talking just a little bit about this Bay Shlishi, that all of us are anticipating the third temple. This third temple is, of course, going to be a very, very special temple. As I mentioned earlier, it will be built by Hashem, at least part of it will be. It will be indestructible. And when it is built, all the services will return as they were in the past. But what will happen at that point when it is, it's, it is rebuilt is the fulfillment of a prophecy that all of us are waiting for. The prophet says there will be a point in time before the year 6000, after Mashiach has arrived, some point in time when there will no longer be death. There will be Tchiyat HaMetim, the dead will rise, but people will stop dying. What does that have to do with anything? Now even though that whole scenario of Bila Mavet Lanetzah, where death will cease to exist, has to do with Tikkun Chet Adam Arishon, it has to do with repairing of the original sin of, of, of Adam, man was supposed to live for eternity, even though life will change in some ways when Mashiach comes, it will still be similar to what we know, people will still eat, drink, sleep, and so forth, but we won't have all the troubles that we've had till now, warfare and the like, and, and famine, also, and illnesses, all, all the problems that we have, we won't have it, but what's interesting is, death will cease to exist, and the reason why that occurs when this Bet HaMikdash is, re is built, is because, remember what we said before, the Bet HaMikdash had the power to remove all impurities from around it. This tremendous Bet HaMikdash that will be built by Hashem will remove all the impurities from the entire world altogether, including the impurity that is the source of death, the Malach HaMavet, the Satan. Once that is removed, obviously people will stop dying. That is the connection of that prophecy to the building of the Third Temple. 
how will this come about? What needs to happen in order for this to, to happen? As I said before, we have to prepare our own Mikdash, our own internal Mikdash, because only when we prepare the Mikdash down here below is Hashem prepared to bring up, down His own Mikdash. There's a very interesting Midrash that says like this, just look at what happened to the Shekhinah throughout history. The Shekhinah started off down here below. It was down here below from the very beginning. Cain comes along Adam Marishon and through his sin, he removed it to the first Rakia. Came along Cain and murdered his brother Hevel and removed the Shekhinah to the second Rakia, the second heaven. Came along Enosh, the generation of Enosh, where they began to worship idols, and removed the Shekhinah to the third Rakia. Came along Dora Mabul, the generation of the Mabul, and removed the Shekhinah to the fourth Rakia, through their sins. Came along the Dor HaPalaga in Babel, where they built a tower, and removed the Shem to the fifth Rakia. Then came the generation of Zdom Ve'amorah through their terrible sins, removed the Shem to the sixth Rakia. Then came the Pelishtim, that whole generation of Pelishtim that is recorded in the Torah, that also through their sins removed Hashem, removed the Shekhinah to the seventh and highest Rakia. So he's all the way up there now. Who brought him back down little by little? Avraham Avinu brought him down from the seventh back to the sixth. It's Haq through the Akedah and his Masim brought him from the sixth to the fifth. Yaakov, through his Torah, his learning, brought him from the fifth to the fourth. Then we have Levi, Kehat, Amram, and who's the son of Amram? Moshe. Finally, you see seven? Finally, Moshe is the one that is able, through the building of the Mishkan, to bring back the Shekhinah down here below. So, what, is, what, what, are we, what can we do? Well, we cannot do what Moshe did exactly, right? But we have the ability to begin to do some of the work. And this is the way it's going to be done. The rabbis tell us Mishkan is called Mishkan Ha'edut. The reason why Mishkan is called also Mishkan Ha'edut is because it gives testimony, edut meaning testimony, that Hashem resides with us, amongst us. The whole world can see that Hashem is with us. Very nice. In order to do that, that the Mishkan should be an Edut again, that the Beit HaMikdash should come down, and the Beit HaMikdash should be built, that the whole world should see that Hashem is with us, we have to also create in ourselves a Mishkan Edut. That we, in the way we live our life, at home and outside our home, as individuals, give a due testimony that Hashem is with us, He resides with us. Do you know what it is? Hilul Hashem, Chaz Shalom, when a Jew desecrates the name of Hashem in his behavior, by being not honest, by being abusive, but just being a bad person, it's terrible. The Shekhinah is driven away from him. Chilul Hashem means halal. There's a vacuum in that particular spot where this man did what he did, this man or woman. So therefore, one has to be very, very careful in what he does if he wants to take part in the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash. And this is what the Rabbi Akos of Kotsk had in mind when he entered the Beit HaMikdash one day and he asked his students, does anybody here know? Can anybody tell me where Hashem is? They said, Rabbi, what kind of a question is that? Male kol aretz kevodo. It says so. Hashem is everywhere. No, he says, Hashem is only there where you let Him in. Some people drive Him away from their homes. They kick Him out by what they do in their home. So if we want the Beit HaMikdash to be rebuilt, we need to invite Hashem back into our own homes. Recreate the Beit HaMikdash in our home with the Shulchan, where we have guests, where we learn Torah, where we make blessings. When we sanctify our homes, we are, Baruch Hashem, then able and ready to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash. May we all have the merit of seeing that being rebuilt, Bimeravi, Amen, Amen, in our days.